id software john romero john carmack and the entire team are possibly one of the most influential and forward thinking collection of individuals and studios in modern 3d rendering i have covered in detail a few years ago now their meteoric rise from mario clones to barons of hell Doom was not the only paradigm they started. In fact, you could argue that the next was the more impactful and longer lasting. In 1996, they launched the Quake engine, which became the leader in all fully modern 3D enabled engines. Also offered hardware acceleration by the emerging 3DFX, ATI Rage, and those Power VR cards. I spent so much money, time, and effort on back in the day. Who can remember those early days of bespoke accelerator APIs such as Glide, OpenGL, and the later Microsoft Direct X, which was not as good and started more as an extension from the previous 2D Accelerator Direct Draw to compete with the dominant Glide during that time. Now history tells us where 3D effects and Glide would end up, with DirectX winning the battle, but OpenGL still endures today in Vulcan, which is again the chosen API for this rebirth of Quake 2, just as OpenGL was all those years ago. We've moved a long way from software renderers, but the Quake engine did start out as a fully CPU-driven engine, just like Doom before it. The hardware came later, but this enabled Carmack to recreate and embellish the game with far more features, performance, resolution, and quality that made it the go-to game for manufacturers to support and advertise. It is still an impressive game, sporting many features we see today. Hard and diffused shadow maps, many dynamic lights, indirect and direct light maps, particle systems, and much more. Running this game now is simple on even low-end hardware, but in the late 90s, you needed the very best S3 ATI or 3DFX could offer. Nvidia never really got a look in until the end of the 90s with its TNT range. I miss those old GPU wars and epic names, that's for sure. This time though, Nvidia is the modern day leader with its brand new RTX card offering real ray tracing for the very first time on a consumer card. This is real time ray tracing. My 2070 here should enable us to enjoy just what this latest mode can do to a PC pioneer. Now this has been crafted by one man, Christoph Schneid. A side project for a proof of concept demonstration of what this can offer in games and real time rendering. I covered a path trace version of Quake 2 before in my ray tracing video last year when the cards were announced. Now this modification entitled Q2 VKPT Quake 2 Vulcan Path Tracing replaces the entire rendering code of the original, replaced with a hardware accelerated ray trace engine that sits behind its path traced function. I covered this in the previous video and mentioned it as opposed to the it just works comment from the reveal. Ray tracing by itself does not solve everything, it's merely a means to an end, with it being a core element of the path trace renderer here. Now as with most advances, this work sits on shoulders of others and I urge you to check out the full blog link below and download it if you have an RTX card and give it a whirl. This kind of work is still absolutely incredible, beneficial for all and enlightening, a much better example of the benefits over Battlefield 5 reflections. Now here I'm going to compare and demonstrate just how the completely new engine path takes an old game and once again places it as a trailblazer for others to follow. But first, a brief description of just what we are seeing and how it all works. And the game still sounds incredible today, and it plays well. It really was way ahead of its time, and it was a step up from Quake 1. Even though Quake 1 never launched with hardware support, the game did get a, a patch pushed out by ID Software, it's software directly, but it never supported it directly, then it wasn't their patch. They released it and then left it out in the wild just to support this version, which did ship with OpenGL hardware support. And that is where this story and journey continue. The first thing that's most simple is you can just jump onto the GitHub and actually download the binary itself and just literally drop it onto your PC. Go and grab the pack file from the Quake 2 game, either the full game or the demo here, and then drop the file straight into the folder and then run the game with all the goodness. You can also download the project itself, run it in Visual Studio and compile it yourself and play around with it if you want. That is in my list of things to do, but for now, I just wanted to dive into the game, cover the visual aspect of it, and just how impressive all this is on the RTX card. Certainly, what I say at the moment, the most impressive thing about them. I really am enjoying what I'm seeing here. 
Now, the most important element that makes this all work is the adaptive temporal filter. That is not a raster-based solution, as this engine is completely raster-free now, aside the GUI. Instead, a 3D space-based filter that groups multiple frames of data together to complete the final image. Again, check out my Ray Trace video where I talk more about this. The stochastic, or see random, nature of the four rays per pixel samples leaves the image very broken and unstable. The filter, alongside a temporal AA one, converges the info to fill in the gaps and improve the final quality whilst keeping performance high. 1080p and 60fps here. Another method helping that is the occlusion method taken from the original game. Cutting lights that are too far or do not influence the scene. Remember, these solutions preclude the screen space option games take now for easier culling and performance because it doesn't work in that environment. They did implement a light cascade hierarchy to filter though and group lights with equal or close influence to each other but they had to resort to this method because of unstable results in the final game. The path tracing sends out rays from each pixel on screen to determine the first surface it hits. It bounces to this to the next light source, which includes one indirect light bounce. Now this will give both direct and indirect light and shadows across the scene along with penumbra shadows and perfectly accurate reflections. You see, every time a pixel is seen from your point of view, the camera's point of view, you literally get a perfect path trace straight to the light source. You can see an example of what I'm talking about on screen. That then gives you the shadow or the occlusion, the culling moments that the occluded object actually blocks out the light. So you get a perfect, essentially, stencil shadow. It will be jittered, it will be messy, and you get that filtered, jittered look on screen. But with the temporal filter and that convergence, it smooths those out and gives you soft, feathered edges, penumbra edges, and that gives you that hard contact shadow and that distance between the light source and the ground, and it looks absolutely incredible. Now, as it's all not linked to geometry or the complexity of the scene, even the amount of light sources could increase with a very small effect in performance, meaning it could adapt to much more modern games. No, it's largely resolution bound by both ray count and RAM. Again, as I talked about in my last video on this, for every pixel you add, the ray count increases by four more rays, meaning this is a hugely resolution bound function. The temporal filter goes a long way in resolving this low tap rate and high performance aims. It incorporates the history of previous frames data, jittered samples over these, and a projection of the surface elements to reduce the artifacts from other temporal solutions and denoise the image. A core feature from the Tensor Cores here and Nvidia's own research into achieving the quality at playable frame rates. As you can see, the results are remarkably good for such a small, fast and demonstrative project. It is, for me at least, the real example of how the ray trace functionality merged within a path tracer can change the fundamentals of just how a game looks, feels and plays, and even how it's made. One main example is lighting artists will have a much easier time, as will material artists, to create a scene, both from a workload perspective and a development one. Real-time path trace direct and indirect lighting means you can iterate scenes and levels much faster than before. And for us playing the game, we benefit even more. Comparing the original game back with its hardware accelerated functionality, like I say, even this version still shipped with a CPU software driven render inside it, but you could choose between OpenGL 3D effects here. Now, looking back at the game itself when it was running back on the original hardware, it's still an impressive game. Like I say, lots of dynamic lights, shadow maps, light maps, and all of that is not available here to Christian. He's actually had to use his path tracing solution, the ray trace, and that's why the game looks vastly different in certain areas. Here you can see the sunlight is the main directional light source, and that bounce gives the whole thing a red hue, which isn't there on the original game because it would have had to be factored in by the artist. But here it's being generated by those ray casts into the scene to work out that natural global illumination bounce. It's a single bounce though, which I mentioned before. That means that in certain areas of the game it's incredibly dark and you can't see anything because there's no light of theoretically hitting it and that's because there's only one bounce of light from the original light source as I just covered earlier so that means that certain parts of the game are too dark to see anything you can see an example on the left here on the old version and the new version how dark the newer version is and this does affect the game itself you also have to sacrifice the particle system because the new version can't support it at the moment and again that can make the game look a little bit flatter than the original one but I think it's a, pay a trade that's worth it due to the fact the additional light 
bounce and all the beautiful shadows that come from this light source here look much better and incredibly realistic. But one of the main benefits of looking at this old game here is obviously everything's got that diffused look, everything's got a flat base, no reflective, no specular reflectance, everything looks very old school and flat. But once you move to the path traced engine here, you see everything has that light bounce, that reflective surfaces. You get loads of specular highlights, reflectance, color bounce, light bounce, shadow casting. Everything looks far more realistic to the point where certain parts of the game are actually lighter and certain parts of the game are actually darker due to that indirect light bounce, which wasn't calculated before. You can see a perfect example here standing under the reflective water. Again, real time reflections here. Everything is reflected and drawn twice effectively. That's why you see lower quality objects, materials, and textures here on the character impaled on the spike. Very low quality and stretched textures on the reflections, but higher in the first person view. These are the kind of limitations you will have to make because it's no longer a case of redrawing a reflection like SSR that's already on screen by using the depth buffer. This is actually going to be redrawing the geometry all the time. So you can no longer call things that are outside of your field of view. But you can see the reflectance and the light bounce in the water actually illuminates the cascade of the shelf underneath. So you can see the details and the textures and the light, which is completely black and there's nothing there at all on the old version. And again, there's no reflections, meaning you can actually play the game looking at the reflection and see an object which you can't see on the floor or you can't see in the sky. This is again the benefit of SSR, which does a good job of emulating real-time reflections, but obviously once you move the camera out of the way, you lose that area to reflect. You don't get any of those limitations here. Everything is reflected at all times. But that additional element of light bounce, the material qualities, and effectively making everything act with a PBR-based material, admittedly, you would still have to handle the different surface levels to mark how reflectance or the roughness level of each area, the fuse levels, would be different between materials to materials. But fundamentally, you only have to set the rule and let the engine and the path tracer handle that work once you've written it. That's why you see so many elements of this game looking vastly different and beautiful once you're playing it. Side by side, the difference is obviously clear. Lighting has never looked so realistic, so convincing, and so organic in a game. The only thing I can akin it to is playing The Tomorrow Children, which was another game that used indirect light sources and bounce. Again, it did simplify the level design, the geometry, and the load on the GPU, but it, what it delivered was some of the best and most accurate light bounce I've ever seen, again using voxel cone tracing. So it's a very similar method here, but obviously with the ac accelerated function of the RTX card, it allows the PC version here to push something that really is quite phenomenal when you look at it. Again, the performance is high. You can see it's managing 1080-60 here with no real issues at all. And like I say, I'm sure it could go higher. This is a very small project, but it's certainly a look forward as to things we can expect in the future. I've mentioned this before and I'll say it again. I do suspect in the next generation of consoles, we will see ray traced functions in those games. We're not going to see a complete replacement for rasterization. I just don't think that's possible, even though that's what we're looking at here. But I do believe we will see a hybrid solution that will achieve results that are as good as this, but visually far more impressive and pleasing because it will be within a modern engine. It will mix up the rasterization methods with real-time methods, which we've seen with things like Battlefield 5, but that's a, a toe in the water. This feels and looks like a step forward, and I believe we will see huge advances. AMD have been working hard behind the scenes to get a Vulkan-based ray trace function out in real-time rendering, and we know this is going on. And Microsoft have not hidden the fact that their DXR is coming forward. All these things point to both the Xbox One's replacement and PS4's replacement having functionality just like we're seeing here in the RTX cards. Admittedly, don't expect this kind of level of performance and this kind of level of GPU throughput. The RTX 2070 is possibly going to be the absolute very best you could expect if the PS5 and the Xbox 2 or wherever they're called come out. But it is a look forward and certainly it looks damn impressive. Anyway, as always, I am self-funded and completely independent. 
If you enjoy this, please like, subscribe, and share where appropriate. Follow me over on Twitter, and if you can, you can support my work on Patreon. I do suggest if you have got an RTX card, or if you're interested, please jump over to the blog that I've linked below and read the information on this. It's very interesting, and the paper involved in the temporal filter solutions. It's all very interesting work, and I'm really am looking forward to diving into this far more. But I wanted to give the game a little bit of a push into the limelight in my limited capacity, so that people get a chance to look at it and appreciate that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. The future looks bright. The future looks ray traced. I'll catch you on the next one. Eat it.